On this episode of Public Scrutiny, we'll be reviewing and commenting on BBC Question Time from the uh, studio, uh, which aired on the 9th of March 2020 and had questions from the Uxbridge area. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like and subscribe for more. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Brandon Lewis, former Conservative Party chairman and Brexit minister, appointed Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in December by Boris Johnson. An MP since 2010, former Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary under Ed Miliband, appointed last Sunday by Keir Starmer as Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Rachel Reeves. Peter Openshaw, Professor of Experimental Medicine at Imperial College, specialist in immunology and lung disease and vice chair of a key committee advising the government on coronavirus. Scottish rapper, hip-hop artist, broadcaster and winner of the Orwell Prize for his book Poverty Safari, Understanding the Anger of Britain's Underclass, Darren McGarvey. And joining us later in the programme, actress, comedian, qualified psychotherapist and mental... Yeah, so things have uh, not been good for me lately. Same for everybody I know, but that doesn't negate my situation. And I probably wouldn't be doing this now had I not seen Ruby Wax's name as a panellist. And by the way, she looks exactly the same as she did in the 1980s. ...health campaigner, Ruby Wax. Good evening, welcome to the programme, welcome to uh, my guests, my panel abbreviated panel, just the two of you in here in the studio, and of course to, to uh, our panellists joining us down the line. As you know by now, for obvious reasons, we have no actual audience here in the studio. I still think that this whole situation's a bit suspicious. I mean, it's worked out very well for those who are getting the shite kicked out of them politically. And if you look closely, you can still see them trying to regain their positions. I don't know if you saw Jeff Taylor's video yesterday about a YouGov poll where apparently 61% of people would like a government of national unity. The machinations carry on even amidst the crisis. But this week we've asked four questions from people living in and around the Uxbridge area and they have pre-recorded their questions for us and we'll be listening to them in just a moment. But also as we're live, contact us um, at BBC Question Time on social media with your questions, your thoughts and your comments and I will get them on this tablet here and I will try and feed them into the discussion as we go along. <coughs> I don't buy that either. When you break this programme down into its elements, like the audience makeup, the weighted panels, etc., do you really believe that the comments are coming in live? I don't. Reality TV. Now, of course, we all saw the clap for carers just now, and we just want to add our little round of applause. <laughs> don't we? Because we couldn't do that. We're not out in the street. But we are suitably grateful to all the work that all the carers are doing. Um, I also wanted to mention, before we start with the questions, that, of course, we've had the news just in the last few moments that Boris Johnson is out of intensive care, Brandon, which is obviously very good news. I'll drink to that. A, a huge relief, I imagine. It's brilliant news, yeah. I mean, it's really good news. It's, it's also a reminder that people can recover more generally. That's good news. There has to be, it's good to have some positive news generally, but it's really good to know that the Prime Minister's on the road to full recovery. I was always confident that he would, and uh, it's really good to know that he's now out of ICU. And what word on how soon he might be out of hospital? Oh, I think it's a bit early to say, literally just as we came on air, that we heard that he'd come out of ICU. He'll be following medical advice, as he has done all the way through, and as he's encouraging everybody else to do as well. But uh, for me, I'd like to see him back to work as soon as he... As, I'd like to see him back fit and well and back at work as soon as possible. But I, I know he'll follow the medical advice and, and do it the right way. OK, well, we're all very glad, I'm sure, that he is out of intensive care, as you say. Right, let's get our first question tonight, which, as I say, is from the Uxbridge area, which is from Mervyn Hogg. Hello, my name is Mervyn Hogg, and I'm a retired medical statistician. The COVID-19 suppression package is beginning to work, but will need to be maintained until a vaccine is widely available. I would rather have the virus. Anyway, this is a bit cryptic, I know, but the guy who made Windows was friends with a guy who most people do not believe ended his own life while in jail. The Windows man went to see him often, knowing full well who he was and what he did. The Windows man has a lot to say about viruses. The noose is closing on them, and they know it. To minimise the risk of rebounds, intermittent social distancing and other measures will need to continue. What might be the criteria for turning such measures 
on and off. How will they be applied in a safe and controlled manner to allow businesses and education establishments to reopen? So Brandon, this is a question that everyone wants answering, is, uh, is when we, might we begin to get out of this situation? <clears throat> when people are fully demoralised, when their anger towards traitor politicians has diminished, when they've forgotten about Brexit and when Prince Andrew once again becomes patron of a children's charity. Well, I've had, uh, actually, I've been involved in two meetings on this very issue today around, particularly with a focus on this weekend, both a, a quad meeting with the Tourna Stay, Simon Coveney, and the first Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland working uh, across uh, UK and Ireland, um, because we, on, in Northern Ireland we, we have that shared land border. But then also later on today we had um, our COVID discussion uh, with all of the devolved authorities and ministers involved looking at what we do for this weekend. And I have to say, all of the evidence at the moment, taking the first part of the gentleman of Mervyn's question, is absolutely right. We've got to stay focused on people staying at home, particularly this weekend, where if we've got the good weather we're being promised, it's one bank holiday where I think we probably all quite like a bit of bad weather to encourage people to stay home, because we do need to stay home. Does that include the BODs installing the new internet hardware? Sorry if I'm being a bit vague, but if I use the actual terms for things, it might have negative repercussions for the channel. I'm fairly sure you know what I'm talking about, though. People want to spend time with their family and friends. I understand that. We all normally do that. But this year it's got to be different. And that time has to be over okay. the phone or video conferencing. So we need to stay home at the moment. We're going to have a look. I think the uh, First Secretary uh, outlined Dominic Raab earlier today. Later next week, we'll have a look at where we've got to, what the modelling is looking at. But we're, we're um, talking term, but at the moment, weeks, aren't we, that we're going to well, be in Well, I think lockdown. certainly for the moment, there's no change to the government's okay. position and people should stay home and continue to follow the guidelines. Um, Peter, let me ask you about this. You're obviously advising the government uh, in terms of coronavirus and, and you advise them, the government makes the decisions, but you're providing the advice. What's your view on how long we might or we should stay in this kind of lockdown? I think it's, it's really vital not to jump ahead and try and make predictions which maybe we can't stick to. Vital? Just give us a ballpark figure and put a caveat in that the time frame is subject to change dependent on circumstances as they unfold. We could handle that, probably. Otherwise it looks like you're covering for the fact that we could be on lockdown right the way through the summer. Although to be fair, when I go to the shops I've noticed more people walking around in groups than I ever have before. I don't think they quite get the idea of what a lockdown is. It's being seen as a bit of a holiday. It's the British way. At the moment, it's very clear that there are some early signs of the measures taking effect, and it's too early to, um, to start pulling any of those um, measures back. It might even be necessary to put extra measures in place if, it's, if we're not driving the rate down hard enough. I think the other thing I'd like what, to What kind of measures is, do you mean, Peter? Yeah. Well, I mean, at the moment, the measures that have been introduced are you know, not as extreme as were observed, say, in Wuhan. That, sir, is probably not the best example you could have gave us. Some of the things I've been hearing are fairly disturbing, to say the least. Where they, where they really locked people down, absolutely, and nobody was allowed out at all. So I'm hoping that if the measures that have been taken so far are sufficient and we can really see a good fall in the, in the rates of hospital admissions and subsequently deaths, then it would be the time to start thinking about easing off. But I, I think it's it, the other very important point that Mervyn made was that the way that we're finally going to defeat this is by, by getting vaccines. And we know that there are uh, 78 vaccines at various stages of development, you know, at least four of them in clinical trial. <clears throat> And ultimately, that's going to be the way that we're going to defeat this is by is by getting you know really good vaccines, which can then you know drive this infection away. I don't trust this guy. I knew somebody who had the flu vaccine every year, and every year she got bad flu. No doubt, vaccine manufacturers are rushing to produce as many as possible. The problem is, is that if you don't get, as he said, a really good vaccine, you could end up being injected with all manner of crap, and the side effects of a dodgy vaccine could very well be far worse than the virus itself. Do you want to risk your health by having a vaccine which hasn't been extensively trialled for a so-called new virus, which, if you caught it, the likelihood is that you'd fully recover from it? There's too much room for error, in my opinion. And that's, that's, I think, our ultimate hope, but that will take time. And we're all being told, as we were again in the press conference today, that we, we need to wait for the peak. 
Uh, and the peak seems to be a moving target. So the chief scientific advisor, Patrick Valance, talked about the peak likely to be this weekend. That was back in, in, on March the 27th. Then today he was talking about we could be weeks from the, the, the highest number of deaths. It's hard to know where we are because it keeps changing. Now hold on. I thought we were currently engaged in Operation Flatten the Curve and we've been at it for a couple of weeks. Now bear in mind the curve we're trying to flatten is a sharp rise in the number of cases which would put the NHS under massive strain, which would mean slowing the transmission of the virus. Knowing that, why was the guy predicting such an early date when the objective was to span out viral transmission over a period of time? It contradicts the curve flattening plan. And furthermore, if his dates are so skewed that only a couple of weeks ago he was wildly off target, why exactly are we listening so intently to what he says? Yeah, well, I mean, we just have to observe this one. And it's like trying to turn around, you know, a battleship. You, you can stop the engines, you can, you can put the propellers into reverse, but it does take time and there's an inherent lag in the system. I think we have to follow the science, we have to follow the facts, and we mustn't jump ahead and try and anticipate too, too much. We really have to wait and see what the effects are. Can I just say that one of, this is one of the key things where you know, the majority of people have been fantastic at following the guidelines, but continuing to do that is a really important part, not giving up on what we've done and what we've achieved everybody together, but keeping going with following those guidelines will be an important part of making sure we do have enough control over this virus to be able to get to see the other side of it and give the NHS that capacity and time to be able to cope. If at the end of this lockdown government announces that our new internet system is in place, it will be a massive red flag for me. I don't trust these people at all because I know who really pulls their strings, who they really work for, and the trouble they're in unless they take drastic measures. A lot of the wealthiest and most powerful people on earth stand to lose everything when the world wakes up to what they've been doing. And so if you don't see the kind of behaviour you want to see over Easter, i.e. people staying at home, are further measures on the cards? Well, we've, we've, I think we've got really good measures in place. The majority of people are generally following those, and I would just stress to people the importance of continuing to do that even over a weekend where it might be tempting to think that they can do something different, don't. And every time somebody stays home and follows the guidelines this weekend, all of us as a country, we're all playing our part in saving a life and helping the NHS. So it's really key that people do that. Someone called Mike Hadley uh, has uh, sent in a message saying, could the government clarify the laws on exercise to resolve the confusion over guidance? I was saddened yesterday, he says, to see an interview with a woman who said she couldn't take her child to the park because she couldn't get there and back in 30 minutes. Yeah, well, some people are fucking stupid, to be fair. I mean, it makes you wonder how she does her weekly shopping. I mean, she, well, that, well, she doesn't have to restrict it to 30 minutes, does she? No, we're clear. People should go out and get some exercise once a day. Uh, what people shouldn't be doing, and somebody who represents a seaside resort, I'm, we're very clear about this in Norfolk, we love having visitors, but Great not Yarmouth. at the moment. Great Yarmouth, yeah, but not at the moment. People shouldn't be getting in a car to travel somewhere to exercise. What they should be doing is taking exercise around and from where they live, doing that sensibly, and following okay. social distancing, um, it's good and important for mental health as well as physical health to get that exercise, but do it in a really sensible and, and conscious of, of the guidelines way. Rachel, let's just um, come back to the question, which is about mm -hmm. uh, how do we get out of this? You know, what, what, what measures can we introduce? Should, do we be turning them on and off? Which businesses might we open uh, first and, and others later? What's a safe way of doing this? What's your view? Or what's the Labour view on this? Well, I could easily say, who cares what the Labour position is? They're not in power. They were rejected by the public. I see no reason for them to have a view on when life should return to normal. Ah, but a government of national unity and all of a sudden Labour become relevant again and get hold of power despite being smashed last December. First of all, I say I agree with what Brandon has um, said about our behaviours at the moment and the vast majority of people are doing the right thing. But the more we do that, the, the quicker we will be able to come out of that lockdown. And so it's in all of our interests that we observe by the rules. But I do think it's important not to put a date. Of course not. We don't need a date on when these are going to be over and that wouldn't be possible. But we do need to start to have some sort of clarification of what circumstances um, would allow us to relax some of these um, rules and, and, and conditions and, and closures. Presumably when the numbers of new cases begins to drop. Thank God Boris is getting better. I had visions of Labour taking over the governance of this nation.
and how you would go about doing that. And so what would be needed in terms of testing, not just a test of, to show whether we have coronavirus at the moment, that those tests need to increase and they need to increase sharply if we're going to meet the government's targets, but also the test to show whether you've ever had it and so if you've got any type of immunity to it. And that along with contact tracing, so we know who you've come into contact with in the period of time that you've had the coronavirus, those are the sorts of measures that other countries like South Korea and Singapore Singapore and Germany are looking at. And what Keir Starmer has said very clearly is that he would like to see some <coughs> government, uh, um, them to publish their, their plans for ending the lockdown. Not the dates, we know that that's not possible, but the circumstances in which the lockdown could come to an end and how the government would go about ending that lockdown. That's what we're looking for from the government. And I think that's what people are, are looking for, some greater clarity about... Uh, uh, the circumstances. And, and is, it, is it possible that, that no one can really know that at this stage? Well, no one knows the date that this can come to uh, an end. But we do know that at some point, uh, these, these restrictions on our everyday lives will be lifted. Uh, but when does, how does the government envisage that happening? Uh, will it be when the number of... Um, when we have uh, testing that shows that um, there's only a certain number of cases being detected every day? and we're pretty confident that that is all of the cases that are emerging because we are doing testing on a mass level, but also that we have the technology or the resources to put into the contact tracing, whether that is some type of technology base so that we know through our smartphone who okay. we've been okay. near to. Technology-based contact tracing and the interesting bit, knowing from our smartphones who we've been near to. Of course, you'd need a network with a high degree of precision to achieve that. As it is, they can say roughly what area you were in with your phone, but being able to tell if you were in close enough proximity to someone to catch a virus, that's another thing. It's that sort of information that the government might need to start thinking about now so that when we're in that position, the government are then in a position to be able to relax the rules and to protect lives, but also to protect livelihoods. And, of course, there are very many people at the moment who are really struggling financially because they're not able to get out to work and pay the bills and put food on the table. There are businesses that have had to close and worry that they'll never be able to open again. And so I think that's the sort of clarification that people are looking for and that we're pushing for the government to publish. And, Darren, of course, that that's, that's the, the big downside of a lockdown, that for some people it's absolutely punishing, not only in terms of economically, but in terms of the situation in which they live. Yes, and I think it's quite appropriate for you to use the word punishing. We have to look at the, the ulterior to the demand to return back to normality for lots of people, particularly those further down the social scale. We have, of course, been living and a kind of iteration of the United Kingdom, which has become increasingly punitive for workers on in precarious jobs, lower class children in schools, people who rent accommodation. So if you explore why many people are so keen to return to work or might flout the rules, many of them, it's because they have a subtle fear that they're going to suffer in some way or that they're going to be punished or reprimanded because that's what their experience tells them about the society in which they live. Well, I'm sure I don't need to remind the guy that the society in which we live has been run by the EU pretty much for the last 20 years, which is why people all over Europe have exactly the same outlook that he's talking about now. So I, I commend the government ministers for this real shift in language and emphasising not the things that are deserving and undeserving about us, but actually this talk of togetherness, this idea that society is a ship and we are only steering as safely as uh, the, the most vulnerable people on it. That, that We've got homeless people now being put into accommodation. So suddenly society is vulnerable because we have so many vulnerable people. I feel that that sort of language and that shift in tone uh, which really does set the tone when you think about the amount of goodwill that's been unleashed. One million volunteers signing up to help in the NHS, deliver stuff to the elderly. Politicians can really make a difference here. I think this needs to extend the rhetoric. People need to be told that they aren't going to be punished, that they aren't going to suffer unnecessarily, <laughs> and that ultimately this is not going to be a pretext for Austerity 2.0. And I think that if, if, if government ministers uh, bring into their awareness those subtle anxieties, that conditioning about being punished or kicked out your flat or excluded from school, 
uh, and, and begin to reflect that in the rhetoric, then, then people m might become better adjusted to this very necessary uh, and, and prolonged period of, of ultimately isolation at home. Do people actually believe that they're being punished? That doesn't make much sense to me. We know why there's a lockdown. Everyone's in the same position, sort of. It'd take a special kind of victim to take circumstances which are being imposed on everyone, and for very well-known reasons, and switch it around like they're being punished. Hardship and punishment are not the same thing. And Peter, can I just ask... Sorry, I was just going to ask Peter. Can I just ask you, what does, what does the peak and the point at which we might begin to ease off the lockdown look like? So we've heard mm -hmm. in Italy they're talking about a certain number of days of a, a plateau of the number of deaths and they're beginning to think about when they might ease a lockdown. What, sure. With all the work that you've done on, on viral threats, what does that actually look like? Well, I think you often only know that you've reached the peak when you passed it. So you can look back and you can see, well, that was a peak and now things are declining. I mean, clearly you don't want to take the brakes um, off completely at that point. And I think the, the point was being made about... Um, about the value of testing and of following up contacts when there are relatively few cases is really important. It becomes incredibly important to have good tests and a good way of following up those contacts so that you can really um, isolate little pockets of infection as the numbers um, come down the other side. Now, I'm not an expert, but if the virus has a 28-day incubation period, I would keep the lockdown in place for 35 days. And that 35 days would begin after the 14th day that the numbers of new cases had fallen. One would think that the current new cases were transmitted before the lockdown started. So it could be that we might see a significant drop in the number of new cases 28 days after the lockdown started. As I said, I'm no expert. But are we talking maybe so if you had a plateau of a number of deaths for a week? then I mean, what are we aiming for here? Yeah, well, I think <clears throat> clearly, you know, as, just as it takes time to slow down, it takes time to speed up again. So as you take the brakes off, then you don't see an immediate jump. And it will take time for the effects of easing to show up in the, in the statistics. So that the whole thing is quite like, it's a very difficult trick. You know, it's like slipping the clutch going uphill um, when you're trying to trying to steer this thing and, and get the right amount of, um, of, of easement. Uh, Darren, you're looking rather frustrated by that answer. Me? No, I, I wasn't frustrated, actually. I, 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 I've just been informed that this is live, so I was actually more disorientated, which does oh. register as a, an agitated expression. <laughs> so the BBC never told him that it was live. Surprising, really. Usually, if it's a pre-recording, it gets edited down before broadcast. So if it's live, they don't have the luxury of being able to edit out any mistakes or naughty bits. Remember Big Brother? Big Brother House, this is Davina. We are live, so please do not swear. And the BBC never told him. You didn't know we were live. I've no idea how that happened, and I apologise. You've been doing fine so far, so don't worry. Uh, let me read you some other uh, messages that have come in. Uh, what have we got? Simon Taylor. We have a very soft lockdown compared to many other countries, so why are we even considering lifting it when we had the second highest death rate in the world yesterday? Someone who calls themselves only noodles. I pass no comment. Why, when the country is in lockdown, are there still thousands of people arriving on flights every day from various coronavirus hotspots without any checks on arrival? Is my memory playing tricks, or does that question get asked every week? We've got another question which I'd like to... another pre-recorded question I'd like to go to from Julia Stadel. Good evening. I'm an Italian national living in the UK. In the last two weeks, I've been closely following the situation both here and in my home country. Many of the Italians that I know living here, and myself included, were wondering how much of the current measures in the UK have been informed by what was learned in Italy. Brandon, we've all looked at the figures coming out of Italy with, I mean, open mouths in horror certainly earlier on, and our death toll is not that far behind it. What lessons are we learning? What lessons are the government learning? Yeah, and I think one of the things that was really quite striking, and I think probably cut through with a lot of um, people, and they saw some of the images that we saw from Italian hospitals, actually, that if anybody ever needed a reminder of just how serious dealing with this uh, virus is, it was, it was very clear from the, the tragedy we saw, we've, we've seen in those hospitals. Let so what here. lessons but, have we learned but, but we are 20 seconds and she interrupted him. 
Our, our experts are talking to their colleagues and we are talking to countries around the world. The chief medical officer I know has been, um, and the chief scientific advisor and their teams and uh, the advisory teams are looking at what's been happening around the world. Not just looking at it, but talking to other countries. Actually, again, just one of the things I was talking about earlier today, just this week, we've seen a, a memorandum of understanding signed between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, making sure we're sharing um, um, experiences and ideas. We yes, were talking no, about how you data talk, today just between about countries. Italy, we all looked at, at what's been yeah, happening no, what in Italy. And we're, no, but hang on. Countries. And we've been looking, but just responding to Julia's question, okay. our, our death rate is, is approaching that of Italy. We were only about 30 under it uh, yesterday, their highest death toll. Should we have been doing things earlier? So she interrupts him for a second time and reiterates Julia's question by asking a different one entirely. Not to be in that well, position? We, we, have, we have, at all times, we have taken the medical and scientific advice around what we think is a correct and appropriate for the situation in the UK. There are differences across countries, and actually we've seen in some countries them using different approaches in different regions of the countries as well. So it's not entirely straightforward and um, other, other experts okay. give a view on that but well, it's not entirely straightforward to do a direct comparison country to country but we have taken the medical and scientific advice about what is the right thing to do at the right time and I think this comes back to an extent to previous question as well as why we've got to be cautious around looking too far into the future when we still need to make sure that we are following the guidelines today in okay. order to keep that Well, this question is, is, is not necessarily about looking to the future, it's rather no, looking to the back. Yeah. So, Peter, obviously you're one of the people advising the government. Mm. What, what lessons can we learn from Italy, or have we learned lessons from Italy? Well, I think we've, we've learned an amazing amount, not only from the experience of our colleagues in Italy, but also in China. And right from the beginning of the the Chinese have been incredibly quick to help us by telling us what they've tried, what they've found to be advantageous and disadvantageous. That's funny. I kind of heard the opposite. Lately, I will admit, especially given the China-centric WHO, I am suspicious of anyone who praises China in any way in relation to this epidemic. And they've also been very, very quick to publish a lot of data um, on the management. And I, I would absolutely give credit to the Chinese for their their generosity, actually, with all the information that they've given us. Generosity? The world is in this situation because of China. I see it that they had an obligation to share that information. Generosity would be if they didn't cause this situation and they were under no obligation to help, but chose to help anyway. That's generosity. Who's this guy again? And also, you know, the more we can slow down this, um, this, this epidemic, the more we can learn and more trials can be done. At the moment, there are literally hundreds of trials going on of different approaches to treatment, many of which are starting to look quite interesting, quite promising. So coming back to Italy, they tried a drug which blocks the so-called cytokine storm, a drug called tocilizumab, which blocks a thing called interleukin-6, for those who are interested. And this, um, in small uncontrolled trials from Italy, looked like it was producing quite amazing effects in some people with advanced disease. So this is now being put to proper trial in a controlled way with, um, with placebos and other, other drugs. And, I, you know, we are learning so much scientifically about how this epidemic is unfolding. And can I just ask you, Peter, I mean, just shamelessly again, to mine your experience since, since we've got you. Italy went into lockdown earlier than us. It was one of the countries that did. And I was struck by... At the press conference today, Dominic Raab saying that uh, the lockdown is working, it, it has worked and it is working, it is saving lives, which sort of begs the question, why didn't, should we have done it earlier and therefore save more lives? Well, that's a good question, Fiona. The answer to which is the scientists advised the government that 60% of the population needed to contract the virus in order for us to develop a herd immunity to it. As I've said before, the government's seemingly incompetent response right at the start of all this was not due to incompetence. It was deliberate and based on the science. I wonder if this guy is going to point that out. Yes, very difficult to get the timing right. We knew the measures that would have to be taken um, and every, everyone knew what was going to have to be done. I think the issue was that the advice that we were getting from some elements of the advisory groups were that the, we could only do this for a limited time to get the maximum benefit. We had to wait until the right moment. You know, I'm listening to him speak and I'm hearing a man who is, on this question at least, choosing his words very carefully. But listen to what he says. 
We knew the measures that would have to be taken. Everyone knew what was going to have to be done to get the maximum benefit. Think herd immunity. We had to wait until the right moment. Firstly, the government told us over and over that it was looking at the science. But now this guy uses terms like everyone knew which kind of widens responsibility from the scientific community and encompasses everybody involved. They were not acting to prevent people from becoming infected. They wanted us to become infected. And then um, apply the brakes and, um, and get the best effect that could possibly be delivered. See the neutral term? The best effect that could be delivered. Which best effect would that be? The one where as few people catch it as possible in order to save lives, or the one where as many people catch it as possible in order for us to develop a herd immunity? It's a very, very difficult thing where, you know, it's a new type of virus, and really we don't know until we try it what's going to be effective. And that, ladies and gents, is who our government was taking its cues from. The people who claim for themselves the title of expert and yet do not know what would be effective until they tried it. And now I think back to the guy that said a few weeks ago that large-scale events were not big spreaders and how that seemed counterintuitive. It was a binary choice. Act to prevent people from getting it, or act so that as many people catch it as possible. And instead of owning it by saying that the scientific community decided that a herd immunity approach was the best way forward, he broadens it by saying everyone knew, like a conductor that blames the entire orchestra for his own bad orchestration. And Dan, from your perspective, what's your view in terms of, you know, have we have we learnt lessons? How's it looking from 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 where you're sitting? In terms of comparisons from other countries, um, I mean, I think sometimes it can be a bit too simple to compare uh, one country with another, and we often lack a lot of the context of you know, how those societies have developed, how they organise their economies. But one pattern that I have noticed, and this is obviously just my own almost anecdotal reading of it, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it does seem like societies where inequality is high are more vulnerable. Has anyone noticed the emergence over the last week or so of a racial narrative with regards to the virus? We Got a Problem today released a vid of a BBC News interview where a professor shuts down a race bait in UN advisor. And here we have this guy drawing the same narrative last night. So be under no illusion, folks. Despite the pandemic, it's business as usual for the left. They've tried to score points by blaming a lack of funding for the NHS, and when that was slammed, they changed tack and portray it as though it's a racist thing. Like they're trying to use inequality and the coronavirus as a means to generate political support. Only they've upped the scale from a national to a global level. So if that's the case, and it's politics as usual for the left, I suggest that we hold position on Brexit. The virus has happened, what will be will be, but they're trying to push their agenda while everyone is distracted and locked down. This guy is a shill, pure and simple. And you can see that in the United States, which is the only society that's more unequal than the UK. Um, and I think that that occurs for all sorts of reasons. Um, obviously, right now... Uh, people like to refer to what's happening in Sweden as an argument for tight, uh, loosening restrictions. But in Sweden, they've got high levels of investment in public services. They've got high levels of public trust in government. They've got high levels of personal responsibility because of all those investments over the long term. Whereas the sort of short termism that kind of blights uh, the, the British political class in this country is, is, is really just the chickens coming home home to roost, unfortunately, and I don't say that glibly or facetiously. No, you're saying it politically, exactly the same as John Ashworth did on Question Time the other week. It doesn't matter what the situation is, you'll always find the left using it as a means to generate political mileage. The left doesn't care about you. All it cares about is power, and it will crawl on its belly like a snake in order to get it. I do hope and I, I, that this is a sobering moment for all politicians of all parties, that the way that we organise our society is, is, is fundamentally unstable in many, many ways. And even Bill Gates, who many obviously think is in cahoots with some sort of Jewish race of aliens in China in order to dominate the world with a man-made virus. Well, the shill level just went through the roof. Try all you want to make the whole thing sound ridiculous by bringing space aliens into it, but all you're going to do is show everyone exactly who pulls your strings. GG. 
uh, nonsense like that actually emerges in a society where there is very low trust in institutions, low levels of education, so on and so forth. He said himself that his foundation and others had brought to the attention of governments the risk of pandemic, the risk of not having vaccines developed, all of the risks he outlined, and he himself even said if we had invested a fraction in that sort of research and that sort of early warning system that we do regularly in maintaining our nuclear arsenal, then we might not find ourselves in the situation that we are currently in. So I think that this is a moment of immense humility for all of us who are deeply invested in the economic and political status quo in this society. Well, you say all of us who are invested, but you're not invested in the status quo. The left are trying to take everything over, to destroy the status quo in the pursuit of a utopian dream. So don't say all of us, because you're not really on our side of the divide. You've shown conclusively which side you're on, and given the relationship that Bill had with Jeffrey, in full knowledge of what he did, you have chosen unwisely. I, I can't think of a better argument for looking at it again. Rachel? I think, uh, to go back to, to Julia's question, there are obviously things that we need to learn from Italy's experience and, and certainly at the beginning of all of this, it, it didn't feel like the policies around lockdown, for example, came quickly enough in, in this country. But as well as learning from And do you think, the... can I just ask, do you think Labour applied enough pressure there? I mean, I'm wondering if there is a sense that Labour went slightly missing in action for the first weeks of the crisis, because obviously all the, the focus was on, or much of the focus was on the, the leadership election. Well, in the end, the government have to make decisions on this, and, and as Brenda said... The I know, but obviously you have, have a role to, be... to play as well, as the opposition. Yes, and, you know, and I think certainly under Keir Starmer's leadership in the, in the last few days, I think that, that Labour's approach has been around uh, supporting the government when they get it right, willing the government to succeed, because it's in all our interests that government does succeed. Oh, I can feel myself going off on one. So given that the Labour Party have tried to stifle Brexit and have used the pandemic to score political points, they're trying to push a racist narrative and will do or say anything to gain power, do you really expect us to believe that you lot are willing the government to succeed? Or are you just another lying Labour cunt? But asking those, those difficult questions to try and be constructive, because actually it's through questioning and challenge that you get better decision uh, making. But the, the point I wanted to, to, to make, we of course need to learn from the experience of other countries and we're a little bit behind the experience of other countries, but we are rapidly catching up. We also, though, need to listen, I think, much more to people on the front line, whether those are people who work in the National Health Service or in our social care sector. And what they are saying, what I hear in Leeds, where I'm an MP, <coughs> and around the country, is we need more testing. We need to be testing people who work on the front line in much higher numbers and ramping that up much quicker. But also, and perhaps I think most importantly, we need to give people on the front line the protective equipment and clothing that they are crying out for. And it is still the case, sadly, and we've seen these two terrible examples in the last couple of days of three nurses in Harrow who were wearing bin liners to protect themselves because there wasn't anything else available, and they've now got coronavirus. Mm. And then a gentleman, a, a, a doctor in East London, who wrote to the Prime Minister and said, give us the protective equipment, we don't have enough and we desperately need it, and now he's dead. And so I would just say to the government, the people who understand this best are the people on the front line who are delivering the care to the people who are our friends and our neighbours and our loved ones. And we need to ensure that their voices are being heard in this. And when they say we haven't got the protective equipment, it's not to be difficult or to cause problems. And I know you know that, Brandon, but it's because they are trying to do the right things and they deserve the best equipment and the best clothing to keep themselves and the people that they are supporting in hospitals or in social care settings. And they're saying they haven't got that. And I think that more than anything else, that has got to be the number one priority of government at the moment, to ensure that the people who are... Sorry, I had to interrupt her at this point because I needed a break from the shameless virtue signalling and pandering to the NHS. What is it? Get everyone clapping for the NHS, then Labour comes in trying to score political points regarding equipment for staff. There's a shortage of gear all around the world right now. How many companies have retooled to manufacture equipment? Or had you forgotten that? dedicating their lives and because of their vocation putting themselves at risk that we are doing everything within our powers to give them 
all of the material and all of the equipment and all of the clothing that they need to keep themselves safe. We've got a situation at the moment where okay. I think around 8% of people in the NHS are, are off sick. And we've probably got the same again in social care. If we ramped up the testing, <clears throat> if we gave them the protective clothing, we could ensure more of them are at the front line and sh ensure that when this comes to an end, that we've lost as few lives as possible. I think that's all of our priority, but we need to listen to those frontline workers. Everything she just said was a point scoring exercise dressed up to look like genuine concern for people she couldn't care less about. All she wants is their vote. Um, Peter, I just want to come to you. I'm going to move on to a different sort of element of this in a moment. But when it comes to testing, and, and we get approached, people comment on testing to us time and time again. Were we too slow to get off the mark with testing, in your view, as a scientist advising the government? Yes, I'm sorry, the line, the line has been breaking up this, this end. Can you, I'll ask you again. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, can you, can you hear us? Rachel was talking about testing. As a scientist advising the government, in your view, were we too slow getting off the ground with testing? I think nobody would say that we've been able to test enough and been uh, quick, quick enough off the mark. I think it's incredibly important to appreciate the great work that the scientists who've been developing the testing in this country have been doing. They've been working really hard to build up from a fairly low base because the, there hasn't been enough investment in public health over the past 10 years. And yet every year the government says it's putting even more money into the NHS. Where exactly does this money go? Wouldn't be to private hospitals by any chance charging the government through the roof for providing our health care, would it? No mention of that. Only the lack of investment narrative. So based on that and some of his other answers, I'm going to say that he's on the left. So that's him, the Scottish bod, the Labour MP and Fiona Bruce on the left against one Tory. Don't know about Ruby Wax yet, but I can't imagine her being a Tory voter. So I make that at least 4v1 in favour of the left. Worse bias than usual. And um, the public health um, infrastructure has been reorganised repeatedly. Um, but I, I think that we do know now that we can get on with the testing, but it's really important that it's really high quality testing. We know that a positive result is positive and a negative is negative. And you know, there's nothing worse than a bad test. Oh, yeah? What about a bad vaccine? So we have to have really good tests. Uh, Peter, thank you. Let me just give you a flavour of some of the, the comments that people are putting, uh, sending into us. So Chris Gamble, was there a big mistake to employ a herd immunity strategy, then change it to mass isolation, losing many days? Neil Watson, is it time for a cross-party committee for COVID? Well, that'll do if you can't have a government of national unity. Anything to get the left involved after their execution last December. In times of national crisis, we have to put aside our political differences and come together to deal with the situation. So Brexit should be delayed until we have this thing under control, etc. COVID-19 making all the decisions and thereby taking politics out of the emergency. Make no mistake, this is pure politics. Tom Poole, how much of a risk is a second wave pandemic as there was in 1918? Is the government planning for this emergency? Let me just move on to another question from... Thomas Kowalski. Clearly, we're all in distress at this very difficult time and people deal with it differently. Recently, a high profile figure traveled with her family to deal with this in her own way. With such strict restrictions on her civil liberties and to us all, what does the panel think the wider impact could be on our mental health? I've been struggling as well, to be truthful. Things have been bad for a while. It's been one thing after another, all big things as well. I have to distract myself away from it all, crawl into my shell and ride it out. And just when you think things are bad enough, something else happens. Sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do is to stand up after you've been knocked down. But you've got to get up. Get off that fucking floor and onto your feet. Otherwise, it's all over. So I think Thomas is referring to the high profile figure from Scotland, obviously the, the chief medical officer there. Um, Ruby, I want to bring you in here. You've been waiting very patiently. Uh, the impact on our mental health, this is something that a lot of people are talking about and there's a lot of concern about it. What's your view? <clears throat> yeah, he's, there, there is a breakup on the line. Uh, so I didn't really hear your question. Well, it just in terms of concerns about the impact on people's mental health of the lockdown, of isolation, uh, simply of loneliness. Uh, yeah, but 
you know, we're stating the obvious here. You know, people say, oh, we need more of this. We need, we all know we need more. Is she having a pop at the Labour MP? I hope so. But there is a, an emergency going on right now. So rather than saying, should we have done this, you, you know, um, those of us who have mental health issues, we've been practicing this for years. So it's almost like the world is now joining us. I, I, I do a, sorry to go on about uh, what I do, but I have a an, uh, an online service called frazzlecafe.org. And every day I have, uh, I do twice a day. There's a hundred people each time. And it's a community of people who are just expressing themselves. And, and really, Emotionally, we're not equipped for this. And it's not just about being mentally ill. You know, I wish a, I, I have a politician would speak human to human at one point. Never gonna happen. They see themselves as managers of humans. They are detached from us because they deal with the population as a whole. Do you think Ian Duncan Smith would have introduced the measures he did if he'd actually listened to those who later ended up committing suicide or dying after being found fit for work? Politicians are detached from the rest of us by profession. We haven't been trained emotionally. We don't understand that it's human to be sad and it's human to be feel like a failure. And it's we've avoided those issues for oh, we get somewhere, maybe in the government. I don't think in the government. Oh, sadly, we're getting a bit of a break up on your line there, Ruby. We'll Can try and we help each other. I mean... I I think, let, let, Ruby, we're going to try and fix okay. that and come back to you if that's all right. Very frustratingly, we're, we're, you're kind of cutting in and out. Darren, you're not cutting in out, so let me come to you. I mean, the, the chance I talked about, we're all in this together. But when it comes to the restriction of civil liberties that Thomas Kowalski is talking about and the effect <clears> on our mental health, we're not, are we? And obviously, it's much easier for some people to, to, to isolate and, and, and much harder for others, you know, people living in flats, that kind of thing. Some people find it very hard to be alone in their own company for extended periods of time. Extroverts mainly. Introverts are comfortable within themselves. Extroverts tend to look outside of themselves for validation. They measure themselves against other people's reactions. I've always found that to be a bit strange, but it is what it is. Yes, I mean, I think most people are going to be experiencing some level of, of, of mental and emotional discomfort relative to what they can tolerate. So while obviously some people are actually dealing materially with more acute circumstances, everyone feels a certain level of strain, everyone experiences certain levels of stress and anxiety, and it's important to note that that is affecting everyone and not just people who are struggling financially. But the, the, the impact of isolation compounded with financial strain, uh, insecurity, uh, as well as many households which will be, uh, you'll have children growing up in a, in a household with perhaps an abusive parent, uh, active addiction in the household. Uh, the, the, the impacts there are quite severe. Um, and, and as for just isolation in and of itself, I mean, social interaction and social connection is everything in life. Well, it's one half of an equation, objective, subjective. Really, we should alternate between the two states. We go out into the objective world and experience it. Later, we reflect subjectively on what happened. And while in that period of reflection, we process our experiences, form conclusions or new ideas, and then take them out into the objective world again, and so on. Objective experience, subjective reflection. At least that's how it should be. I think there's a massive imbalance, though. Very little attention is given to our subjective selves. Everything is measured against the objective standard. If you have a world like that, you shouldn't really be surprised at the negativity people experience if they're left in their own company for extended periods of time. Perhaps this lockdown might force people to become reacquainted with their own inner self. From the moment that we are in the womb, we hear the voice of our mother. This brings online many of our first kind of cognitive systems. As we develop as children, we get a sense of our place in the world as well as our personalities are shaped by the quality of the social connections around us. And even when we have grown to full adults and we're leading our lives without other people to connect to in physical space and run our thoughts by and get a sense of usefulness and helping others and listening to others and sharing honestly about how we feel, then we become very unwell very quickly. And the problem is that we often don't detect how unwell we've become. 
Um, we begin to live in our own heads. We begin to buy into uh, the anxieties, the fears, the resentments that, that, that often we can get away with. Uh, and daily life by running out for a jog or going on a long drive or booking a holiday or doing some uh, retail therapy. It sounds like he's saying that you buy into anxiety, fear and resentment unless you can distract yourself away from it by other means. But that doesn't deal with the underlying issue though. Why not engage in a bit of self-dialogue? Do a bit of soul searching to find out why you're anxious, fearful or full of resentment. Then you might actually address the issue rather than using distraction to get away from it. That's you in there. All those thoughts and feelings. That's you. You don't exist in the outside world. If you're having to use external mechanisms to distract you away from yourself rather than engage in a bit of soul searching, then that self-neglect may actually be the underlying cause for the negativity you feel inside. If you deal with that, maybe you won't have to distract yourself in order to get through the day. Now, a lot of these things that, that, that we previously kind of defined ourselves by have been removed, so it's immensely challenging in many respects. I also just want to touch quickly Yes, just on quickly, Dara, just because we've got Ruby back and she's desperate to get in. ...about the, the case for uh, loosening the lockdown because of all of the impacts that we're going to see on people, including the mental health problems, people who aren't going to get treated for cancer, yeah, all of these I things. The difference between all of the negative impacts of the lockdown whether they be medical or mental or emotional or financial, is that these things are not unknown quantities. So we know roughly how we okay. can address a lot of those things or at least mitigate them. We can divert resources to them. We can raise awareness to them. We can deploy people in the community to support. Right. COVID-19 an... is an unknown quantity. I okay. still don't know very basic things about it, except the fact that it seems to have evolved okay. specifically to avoid detection okay, and, Darren, and I just complete I, confusion yeah, and yeah, all of the okay, human systems okay. that have been designed in order to keep our society orderly. So so while I do accept um, and I don't dismiss um, completely those arguments for listening to lockdown, particularly for those impacted uh, who might be in some kind of danger, uh, COVID-19, we just don't know enough about okay. it. And we just don't know what sort of genie we're letting out, out of the bottle. All in right, that regard. Darren, sorry to interrupt you. See, Ruby, we've got you, Ruby, got you back and you're, you're, you're very keen to, to, to come in now. Yeah, I mean, we all understand that. But again, it's all, pla sorry, but it's a lot of platitudes. What do we do that connects people? And what's uh, what's just um, in, inspiring is that when you do see people now, they are connecting in a way that they've never connected before because we need each other now. I mean, we're in a mutual trauma. And, and so it's no good talking about, yeah, you know, of course, we lived in a world where our only identity was what we did for a living. And yes, we were run by social media. So maybe we can learn from what's going on now that, you know, um, I had somebody on the line today during one of the Frazzle cafes who said, you know, rather than looking at the news the whole time to see the death toll, because, you know, that pumps up your anxiety too, you know, let's talk about emotional contagion, is that you can really think to yourself, what can I do for somebody else today? Maybe call somebody who needs help. Maybe, you know, get in touch. Maybe do the shopping. That'll make you feel better. Oh, that's great. So you call someone, not out of concern for them, but because you're trying to make yourself feel better. And then you can virtue signal about it. You can tell all your friends how caring you've been in the pursuit of trying to cover over your own inner negativity which you refuse to acknowledge or deal with. Don't phone me up. Or at least if you want to talk to me, that's fine. But don't phone me up with the pretense that you're concerned about me when the truth is it's you that has the issue. You know, even if you're depressed, um, which, by the way, there will be a tsunami when this fight and flight phase is over, but let's just concentrate on physical safety now. But I think by being aware of other people, which we haven't been for a long time, uh, th that kindness, as I say, is also infectious. So we should try to create, uh, uh, you know, m media or, or get somebody. I love that the Queen came on and, you know, calmed us all down. But could there not be a spokesperson? We don't have a voice that doesn't just uh, say, yes, we're in danger. Yes, we shouldn't go out. We know that. But somebody who could train us to understand that it's human to be sad, it's human to feel like a failure. Uh, you know, just be honest and speak human rather than standing on your soapbox. And I think we can make a connection that might last past past this uh, catastrophe. And Ruby, you're talking about the longer term impact of this once we've got past the fight or flight mode. And you talked about a tsunami of depression, which I sincerely hope not, obviously. But in terms of the longer term impact, what do you think that will be then? 
The longer term impact is, um, you know, some people are born resilient. It's in the genes and other people who, uh, you know, are vulnerable. There will be major mental illness. And as I always say, mental isn't something that happens from the neck up. Mental is physical. It'll break down your immune system, which makes you even more vulnerable. But I don't want to stoke fear. I really, okay. you know, I, I'm really, I really think people should try to connect to other people. I know they can't do it physically, but we were always too busy in our lives before. Maybe now we have the time to make that phone call and, and reach out and say, maybe we could all get phone numbers of, of five other people and call up and ask how they are. Let, let's make some of these um, okay. possibilities. Uh, Brandon, do you want to talk human, as, as Ruby <laughs> was requesting there? I well, I always try. I don't know if as a politician I may not succeed. But... In the current circumstances, that is an incredible statement for you to make, even in humour. I do try, but I think it's really interesting what the point Ruby just made, because actually one of the things I've found is, first of all, I've worked hard to keep a bit of a routine, but I've definitely been talking to friends and had calls from friends, I know my wife has, that I wouldn't normally speak to quite as regularly, and some I haven't heard from for a while. I think there is a really important thing here about the, one of the benefits. We, we often, are, and certainly when I was in the Home Office, were talking about the dangers of social media. Actually, technology now can be hugely yeah. helpful with all the various apps there are to have video conferencing to connect with people. It's not the same as body language, but you can see people, talk to people, and reach out. Whether you're making the call to connect with a friend or somebody you haven't seen for a while, or because you need help or you think they need support, it's a really important time okay. to do that. And I have to say, in my life, I've certainly noticed that. My wife pointed out to me the other day. There's a few friends we were talking to that we probably haven't spoken to for a while, and we've made the effort to. And I think and that's a really important and thing. And we're too. We, never, we were never trained in listening. <laughs> and I hope social media now develops ways of saying, you know, on Twitter, I don't feel very well. I feel weak today. And everybody will rush to help you. Yeah, like that wouldn't be open to abuse. You get one person calling for help in order to gain attention and loads of virtue signalers arrive wanting to feel good about themselves and most of them are acting for selfish reasons. Rather than having to show, look what I've got, look at my status, I think that drove up a lot of mental strain. So well, look, now we can learn. Well, Ruby, you'll be glad to hear someone called Michelle Simpson has uh, sent in a message saying, totally agree with Ruby. It seems if you've already received treatment for mental health, it's already in your toolbox for coping with isolation and social distancing. Uh, Muki says the impact on our mental health will be huge. Anyone who has been locked away from human contact for any length of time will fully understand that. Sharon Chapman says, what about the mental health and well-being of people, especially who are in lockdown alone, mm. that live in flats, mm. apartments, when they, why can they not sit in a park? And coming back to Thomas's question, he's talking, uh, Rachel, about the restrictions on civil liberties and the impact of that on our mental health. Mm. Well, I think in a way that the term social distancing is an unhelpful one because we need physical distancing and we're doing that right now in this studio. But actually, we don't want to be socially distancing ourselves from people. We want to be keeping up those connections because they are incredibly important uh, to help us all through this. And I totally agree with Ruby that a lot of people's mental health is going to be incredibly badly affected by this. Some people who already struggled with their mental health and other people who may not have known that they struggled with their mental health but certainly are struggling with it right now. But also, I think Ruby's point about... It has unleashed some really wonderful things in our society as well, hasn't it, all of this? The looking out for our neighbours and our friends, the phoning up our family members and recognising that actually we are not, um, you know, little isolated atoms, but we are part of something bigger. It's odd that you say that, considering the left have tried to make those who oppose it feel like they're on their own, isolated an extremist, a racist, a bigot, a xenophobe. They've sought to censor, deplatform, and remove from social media anyone that it considers to be a threat. And looking out for, for, for others. And I also agree with Brandon's point about, you know, having a routine. I've got two little children at home, and so I'm homeschooling as well as uh, everything else. But How's it that does give you... <laughs> Great. I mean, I'm brilliant at it. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Um, but it does give you a sort of routine. You know, you've got to get up in the morning, you do PE with Joe, you might do a bit of maths and literacy, and then you let them go and play with the Lego. But there is a little bit, at least, of a, of a routine. And, you know, I'm incredibly lucky. For this lockdown, I am with the people I love. But that's not the same for everybody. Some people are on their own, and that is incredibly difficult for some of those people. Other people yeah. are with yeah. abusive partners or in abusive relationships. They are stuck on the 10th floor of a block of flats with 
two young children. You know, those experiences. It comes back to Darren's point as well. This is not... Not everybody is experiencing this lockdown in the same way as are we. It depends on the circumstances you're in, in terms of your mental health, your physical health, and the surroundings in which you live. And I think that those inequalities, those stark inequalities in society are coming home to us. And I, I hope after this we can build a different type of society where we do worry more about our mental health and our social connections, but also that we tackle some of those economic inequalities that mean that some people have got so little and some people have got so much. Back to the political narrative then, building a better society and tackling inequality. Taking the opportunity to spout Labour's electioneering jargon, thinking that if they say it often enough, people will start to believe them. And Peter, you're sitting listening patiently there. I mean, is yeah. this is the effect on mental health something you factor in when you're coming up with your plans and your and your, and your advice for the government? Yes, I mean, on the advisory committees, there are mental health experts, and it's hugely valuable to have them there. I mean, I think we should also just flag up that there are quite profound consequences on the mental health of some of the key workers and the. Yeah. Healthcare workers in particular who were taking extremely difficult decisions under very tough circumstances may have to actually make life and death decisions that they really feel uncomfortable about um, subsequently. Uh, this has been highlighted by colleagues at King's College London talking about moral injury um, in that you have to make a decision which you then you know, go away and think about afterwards and you think, you know, that person could have lived if only... I'd made a different decision, and they feel you know, a, a great sense of, of, of loss and of guilt. I wonder if the scientific community feels the same way. Do they regret the herd immunity mindset? Do they regret that decision, given the lives that were lost? I doubt it. Mm. Uh, Ruby, you just wanted to add something in there. Sorry, but I, but I, I, I completely sympathise with that. And rather than saying, should we have done something earlier, as we should have physically, it would be nice now if somebody could concentrate a little on what what should we do when, when the trauma really kicks in. Um, if somebody could just put their attention on that, because that'll be the second wave or the third wave, that, that we will be mentally shaken. And I don't mean people with mental illness. I mean those people on the front line. Can we start thinking of what we can do now? OK. Let me take a, another question, um, which I think is particularly pertinent, given the fact that we're coming up the Easter weekend, from Louis Killick. With the lockdown taking its toll mentally on many members of the British public, is it right for them to use their allocated allowance outside of the home for things other than exercise? Good Lord, they're pushing the whole mental health thing today. I wonder why. So, Dan, I just wanted to ask you about this. There's been so much um, talk from police chief constables, uh, from the government, from, from, from local councils, some of whom are closing parks. Uh, we heard the government saying, actually, don't close parks unless you absolutely have to. Uh, you know, if you've got a back garden, it's, it's not so bad. Obviously, if you haven't, it's a, it's a whole different story. And the question here is about, can pe should people use their time outside? Should they be able to use it for things other than exercise? So, I don't know, playing with the kids or just getting some fresh air? What's your view? Oh, sorry, were you speaking to me there? Darren, I was. I was. <laughs> Welcome I'm sorry, back, I'm, Darren. I'm, I, for, you'll, for, you'll forgive me, obviously. It's very strange just being in this kind of, like, non-environment and connected of to course, you. Of know, the, the whole just thing is so strange. We're generally the inability to, to exercise and go outside. Well, no, what we're no saying, what, we, what Louis Kinnick was asking is, is it right, given that the, the mental toll the lockdown can take on people, is it right for them to use their allocated allowance outside the home for things other than exercise? And we've heard so many different things about whether people can, can you know, sit down in a park or sit on a bench or they can't or... What's it look like to you? Just go out once a day. Give yourself an hour, go for a walk, sit in the park, do your shopping, whatever. My God, we're not prisoners. Yeah, I, 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 I just... I... I think there's a risk for people in terms of the level of judgment that they might experience from other members of the public. There is a kind of McCarthyism that's creeping in slightly where, you know, you've got middle class people on Instagram doing clarinet lessons and yoga. Meanwhile, the working class people who are ensuring that they have all the supplies that they require to survive 
are being viewed sceptically on the news, on public transport and harangued by police. So I think that that's beginning to factor in to, to how people move around. It certainly is for, for me as well. Um, I think just more clear guidance in terms of what, would, what, what wouldn't undermine the general effort of everyone in society collectively acting to try and uh, kind of flatten the curve, as they're saying. Um, but obviously, just being outdoors, breathing fresh air, um, and 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 getting a bit of exercise does does help immensely. I mean, I, I've I've had my fair share of mental health problems. Uh, I'm I'm in recovery from alcoholism and addiction, and there are certain things that I need in order to be able to function. And while obviously that I, I'm quite limited just now in what I can do, if I can get out for a run for twenty minutes or even just a walk, then I do I do feel a lot better. Uh, but I know that the, the, the options that are available to me might not be available to everyone right now. I hope that answers your question. It's it difficult does. to hear what you're asking. Oh, Dan, you're doing, a, you're doing a sterling job, so thank you so much. So, Brandon, just clear this up for us. You know, we're coming to the Easter weekend. Some people are asking, why can't I sit on a park bench? Or, or just, you know, if I'm out, out on a scra you know, piece of grass, just lie down and take a few rays for, for 20 minutes? Well, <clears throat> this is coming back to this point around thinking about, actually, the people that... Um, but just being mentioned a, a few moments ago about the people on the front line. And what I would say to people is every time you do something that moves away from where the guidelines are and you go out and do something that's unnecessary, you are creating that bit more risk of another person being ill and putting more pressure on those people on the front line who we all owe a huge debt for what they're doing. And actually, they are absolutely some of the people who need that opportunity themselves to get out and have some exercise, some fresh air, that space. But some people might say... But hang on, some people might say... Why is it okay for someone to walk in a park for 20 minutes, but not okay to sit on a park bench for 20 minutes? If you're someone who's going stir crazy at home, go out for a walk, get some fresh air. You know you're okay to go out once a day. As I say, give yourself an hour. If people can't see the difference between that and a day out sunbathing, there's something wrong. You should be aware enough to know if you're breaking the guidelines or not. Well, actually, I think part of it is down to that sort of social behaviour and the way that people work and interact off of each other. So if somebody goes into a park and is sitting on a bench or sitting down and sunbathing and somebody else then decides to do this, you very quickly get to a point where you haven't got people out doing the, the, the exercise that they need and the minimal amount of time outside the home to help flatten this curve. What you've suddenly got is a lot of people spending time outside, sitting spending down. More, time. more Exactly, yeah. So it's, it's getting the balance right. And that's why we're, we're trying to do this in a way where we ask people to use their good common sense to follow the guidelines in a really sensible way that is thinking of others as well. And actually, as, as I said earlier on, at the core of this, it's thinking about those people on the front line because every time you follow the guidelines, staying home wherever you can, other than that bit of exercise or if you have to get to work, and following the social um, distancing and the guideline, guidelines that are set out there, you're if playing you your part in saving a life and helping the NHS. Ruby? If you are going outside, could you at least look at other people? Oddly, I've spoken to and looked at more people than usual lately. There seems to be more interaction based around social distancing as people wait for others to pass and thank each other for waiting, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Just for change, because that also creates that oxytocin, you know, that uh, what we were talking about, the, the bonding chemical. Can we not start making eye contact, even if you're 12 feet away? I think everybody has to do a little inch and then the world starts to have a ripple effect. If you can pass a goodwill onto somebody, however you do it, open the door for somebody. Gradually, gradually, the world gets more conscious. And can I just say one more thing? If anybody out there would like to come to Frazzled Cafe. Oh, <laughs> Ruby, you're giving it a plug. OK. Every day. So it's a good way to talk to other people who feel like you do. I have Thank to say, I, I have noticed when, I, when I'm out on my, my little bit of exercise, People aren't looking each other in the eye, actually. Everyone, because we're all trying to keep our distance, so we're all looking away and trying to work out how do I dodge that person or do I need to step into the road? I mean, it's, it's a very strange atmosphere. I Are you you're... happy with it in terms of... You know, there is some confusion among, for some people, certainly, about whether exactly how they can be outside and in what circumstances. Yes, that's, but I think your experience that, you know, and, and Ruby's right, we should, you know, we should smile at each other when we're passing. But you can see what is happening is that, that people are, are just wanting to make sure they're doing the right thing and not to, to, to stop or pause, but just to use that, that, that short space of time they've, they've got. Because most people want to do the right thing. And I think it's really important to just keep reminding ourselves, you know, there are a few people 
people who are going to go and uh, sunbathe or uh, some of the stories about, you know, hosting parties last weekend. Those things are totally irresponsible to have a party and to invite people around to your, your, your house or to congregate yeah. in, in groups because, as Brendan says, that is going to put more pressure on our health service and actually it's going to prolong the lockdown for all of us. So the more we can do to, to abide by the rules. Um, you mean guidelines? If it were anyone else, I wouldn't have picked at it. But when so-called lawmakers start calling guidelines rules, I see it as a shift in their position, just as I do when they call statutes laws. And to only go out when, when needed. And, you know, look, I, I think it is important that people are able to exercise, and I would not like to see those, um, those, those freedoms curtailed. And obviously but, it is stricter in, in some other countries. But, but, mm. but this is the point. Uh, unless we stick with the rules that we've got, they will have to be tightened uh, to everyone's detriment. And that is just, to, you know, to encourage everybody to do the right thing this weekend and in the days and weeks ahead, because that will ease the pressure on the health service, uh, save lives, and it will... It it will mean that we can come out of this sooner than if people just carried on like it was business as usual. So, Brandon, just clarify. I mean, oh, oh, sorry, go on. Peter, is that you no, I, coming in? Yes, it do. It mustn't, it mustn't seem irrational or punitive. I think it's very important that people understand, you know, when they're following the science and they're doing things which are not going to promote infection. But I personally can't see what's wrong with sitting down and taking a bit of sun. I mean, the sun is very bad for this virus. It damages its genetic material. So... No, that seems a fair enough thing to me. Well, it would seem that we've been a bit fortunate with the timing then. It makes me wonder whether the virus could survive the summer. Brandon? Mm. Uh, well, I'd say I think people should be, again, now they're getting that exercise. So what we've, we've got to but use so what are we to make sense, of that then? We have Peter saying, well, look, if you want to sit, sit well, down I get for a few minutes, why no, not? Look, I get the logic of what Peter's saying. The reason we're saying to people not to go hang around and... Uh, go sunbathing and relaxing in places is once one or two people start... As we said, I represent a seaside resort. If people start coming to the beach to take their exercise but actually are relaxing and sunbathing on the beach, suddenly we'll end up with the same number of people on the beach as we have in a peak Easter. We cannot have that. So we have to say to people, go out and get your exercise, follow social distancing, but other than that, please stay at home. And that will mean we can all come through this and enjoy our sunbathing later this year or next year. Next year? It's April. Five months until September. I find it odd that the same government that wanted 60% of us to catch the virus is now locking us down so that we don't catch it and overload the NHS. That's what the lockdown was for, flattening the curve. I see no reason why we should still be flattening the curve for the next few months. At some point, people will rebel against it. We're all on lockdown because of a virus that for most people will be very mild and will fully recover from it. Next year was a red flag. And we will all be here to do it and the NHS will be able to get us to that point. So the basic message is you can go outside, but you just have to keep on the move. Well, go out, get that... Unless, unless you're travelling to work, go out and have the exercise. That's an important part of mental health. But that's what it's for. And other than that, please, and particularly this weekend, when it will be tempting, And it'll be home. really warm, yes, Absolutely. almost the country. OK, well, I think, I think we've got some <coughs> clarity there, at least. Our hour is up, I'm afraid. I think we could talk about this for some time to come. Question Time will be back next week, live at 8 o'clock on BBC One. So tonight, our recorded questions came from Uxbridge. And next week, we'd like to hear from people in and around Wolverhampton. We can't, of course, go there, but we're doing our best to virtually go there. So, and we'd particularly like to hear from people there. But there's been an unusually high number of coronavirus cases there. So we'd like to hear from people there. I know it's not the same as coming along to the programme, getting a free cup of tea on the BBC, perhaps, and being part of the whole evening event. But nonetheless, you are what makes the programme possible and what makes it special. So we'd really much like to hear from you. Um, so if you live there in Wolverhampton or around, uh, apply in the usual way. Go to the Question Time website. Uh, and, and if we get back to you, uh, if, if you're asked, we will ask you to record your question and then we'll play it uh, as a pre-recorded clip, as we did here this evening. Otherwise, um, you can join in the conversation, carry on the conversation with Adrian Charles and guests on Question Time Extra Time, and that is on Five Live right now. But for now, thank you very much to the panel. To Peter, Ruby and Dan, thank you for joining us, and, of course, to you at home for watching. From Question Time, bye-bye. Well, there we go, another one done. If you made it to the end, well done. You are truly the hardcore. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a like and subscribe. Until next time, see you in a bit.